the link to the text of the event so that everybody can have it for accessibility um, and I will do my best to transcribe parts of the Q&A at the end. Um, so first I want to thank you all so much for being here on our third Words Together, Worlds Apart event on the theme of motherhood. Um, just letting you know non-readers will be muted um, and readers through the duration of the reading. So if a question arises while someone is reading, please feel free to use the chat feature to type it in. Um, and after our five readers are done, I'll open the floor to questions, at which time you can either write in your question for me to read aloud, or you can say, I have a question, and then I'm happy to unmute you so that you can ask the question yourself. Um, and if there happen to be there shouldn't be any intruders because we're letting people in individually. But just in case, if that happens, I will close the meeting and open it back up with the same link and not let that individual in. Um, so thank you for being mindful of these guidelines so that we can listen and interact with one another in a somewhat ordered chaos. Um, and I'm excited to be joined by my lovely co-host, Kelly Grace Thomas. Uh, she and I will alternate hosting um, and one of us will be in doing the front end while the other one is doing the back end uh, every week. Um, so Words Together Worlds Apart is meant to get us through this time but also hopefully endure beyond it to maintain and build our community across distance and time zone through our shared love of words. Every two weeks poets will share their work around a theme and right before Mother's Day weekend, I'm so excited to bring you incredible mama poets tonight. After the reading, I will leave you with a prompt to write your own poem responding to the theme. Following the reading, or I'm sorry, follow the reading series on Facebook at WTWA, and I'll just post this in the chat, 2020 and Twitter, same thing, WTWA 2020. Um, and also there's a suggested $5 donation to support the reading series and its readers, which can be paid through Venmo and PayPal. The funds raised will be distributed among the readers and the series. Contributions are always welcome, but never required. Um, so as is now the tradition, the host will start us off with a poem of theirs on the theme. And as a mama poet myself, I now write almost exclusively about motherhood because there is no part of my life, no second of my day, not influenced by it, and currently touched both physically and emotionally, as we discussed in the beginning, um, by my children's presence 24 seven. While motherhood is never easy from pregnancy and childbirth to the postpartum experience that goes on indefinitely, in the current quarantined environment, Many mothers are faced with the added challenges of being their children's full-time teacher, best friend, worst enemy, imaginary friend, and much more. All while trying to work and juggle the home, often under financial strains and with variable amounts of help from partners, and not to mention the psychological strains and lack of time to, or access to self-care. So here's a short new poem inspired by Mothering Through Pandemic. Um, it's called Under the Supermoon or Motherhood in Pandemic. I'm only alone now when I walk the dog, that four block loop around our home, and the moon is full and haloed pink because what animal when alone doesn't look up to the stars in wonder or hopeless wishing? And tonight there are no stars, just ignited rock. A neighbor told my son she'd steal when he asked, are you a bad guy? And she responded, only at night. Oh, how we let ourselves be bad, only when we think no one's watching, when even light is this uncertain crescent glow between lonely and abandoned, and we are held by longing to be alone long enough to steal that moon. I'm so grateful tonight for this pseudo alone time with all of you. 
Um, and our incredible readers, Tracy Brimhall, Camille Dungy, Sonia Greenfield, Keisha Kaipours, and Era D. Matthews. Please support these amazing poets by purchasing their books through independent bookstores or directly from their publishers. Authors and small businesses need our support now more than ever. So let's begin. Um, and throughout the reading, I'll be posting links to the books. Let's begin with Tracy Brimhall, who is the author of four collections of poetry, Come to Slumberless from the Land of Nod, Copper Canyon Press, woohoo, just out, you can buy it, I'll share the link. Uh, Saudad, Copper Canyon, also Our Lady of Ruins from Norton, and Rookery from Southern Illinois University Press. Her poems have appeared in The New Yorker, Poetry Slate, The Believer, The New Republic, Orion, Best American Poetry, She's received a National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellowship and is currently the Director of Creative Writing at Kansas State University. Please give a big welcome to Tracy. Thank you so much, Julia. I don't know if I rem told you this, but um, my son and I read one of your poems and he said, so a poem doesn't have to have real things in it, but it still has to tell the truth because then we were figuring out what a poem was and that was his definition based on uh, hearing your poem. Um, so we talked through each line and that was his definition. Um, so while he is not around and is in the bathroom, I want to start off with my first poem, which has one of the things I think people don't say much about motherhood, which is motherhood and sex or also sex while pregnant, um, which is in this poem. And while of course, that should be so many levels of different connection. I also just want to point out that the poem is called self deliverance. Um, even amidst carrying a body and sharing a body, um, that it's still a poem um, with that kind of a title. So this is my first poem, Self Deliverance. Can I say it? I am of a darker nature, one that might ask a man to do something worth repenting. Say a whip, a harness, say pleasure any way I want it. I want a body with another body to say more than words the light furrowing of nails on shoulder blades to signify you and forever, and yes, a hand on my breast to signify, I want you like a pious woman wants God's middle finger to scrape the psalm from her tongue. The child I carry turns in the dark of his first loneliness, thumb in its mouth, learning what it must. I'd like to think that love for one kills desire for all others. I'd like to think my doubts prove I hunger for the eternal, but I am wet and sapphic like any good sinner. All sad cry and gentle astonishment that a body with another body burns brief and desperate as prayer. Um, so I uh, left a, a few choices up because I was only gonna do three poems, but I put four up there because I, I wasn't sure. Um, but I think I do wanna go straight to the next one for anyone using the text. Um, and read Oh Wonder. Um, and I always give this shout out uh, when I read it um, to my writing group. And one of my writing group is here. Luis, I don't know if you were with the group when I workshopped this one, but it was one where everybody's like, yeah, you're not going deep enough. You're not staying true enough. Um, you know, push harder on the scary parts. And I'm really grateful that I have people in my life um, that push me to say the truer thing. So this is Oh wonder. It's the garden spider who eats her mistakes at the end of day so she can billow in the lung of night, dangling from an insecure branch or caught on the coral spur of a dove's foot and sleep, her spinnerets trailing radials like ungathered hair. It's a million pound cumulus. It's the troposphere holding it, miraculous. It's a mammatus rolling her weight through dusk, waiting to unhook and shake free the hail. Sometimes it's so ordinary it escapes your notice. Pothos reaching for the windows, ease of an avocado slipping its skin. A porcelain boy with lamp black eyes told me most mammals have the same average number of heartbeats in a lifetime. It is the mouse's engine that hums too hot to last. It is the blue whale's slow electricity. Six pumps per minute is the way to live centuries. I think it's also the hummingbird I saw in a video lifted off a cement floor by firefighters and fed sugar water until she was, again, a tempest. 
It wasn't when my mother lay on the garage floor and my brother lifted her while I tried to shout louder than her sobs, but it was her heart, a washable ink. It was her dark's genius, how it moaned slow enough to outlive her. It is the orca who pushes her dead calf a thousand miles before she drops it or it falls apart. And it is also when she plays with her pod the day after. It is the night my son tugs at his pajama collar and cries, the sad is so big, I can't get it all out. And I behold him, astonished, his sadness as clean and abundant as spring, his thunder heart a marvel I refuse to invade with empathy. And outside, clouds groan like gods, a garden spider consumes her home. It's knowing she can weave it tomorrow between citrus leaves and earth. It's her chamberless heart cleaving the length of her body. It is lifting my son into my lap to witness the birth of his grieving. Um, and the, the next one uh, is called Kiving. Um, and it's one that somebody wrote me about and it's one that I don't read often. So I kind of wanted to um, maybe read it tonight to thinking about motherhood um, and the children that we have and the children that we um, might be little minnows in our uteruses, but that don't become babies. Um, whether it's because we didn't want them or because uh, we wanted them, but they weren't able to, to come. So this is Kiving, um, and this is the last of the three poems I'll read. Lord, there is nothing special about you, unless blue stem is, unless the seat seat of the yellow warbler is a disobedient prayer you always honor, unless the crows hunched on the fence post like a common row of Puritans hadn't commanded me to dig a grave with my hands and lay in it an animal. Whoops, oh no hadn't commanded me to dig a grave with my hands like an animal and lay in it a guest. Too much, too much breast. Nothing here is special unless a grasshopper graces it, unless the way cicadas bruise the silence is dear to those who hear it. The danger here is wind and the way last year's grasses give themselves too easily to the drip torch. Lord, I still grieve the daughter I didn't want. Her blood burned on the bathroom floor, her new, sky, her new skyless life among root lace, pin of her heart stitched into the living field, the bluest stone. There is nothing special about her unless grief is special to those who carry it. My God, who knows what it is to lose a child, I lie in the ground as if I'd made a burrow and not a burial as if all sleeps are hibernations, as if all this weeping is waiting for the new season to brighten the ground around me with snow. Thank you. Oh, I feel like I need a few minutes after those incredible poems, Tracy. I'm, uh, I can't wait to get my copy. It's coming from my local bookstore. They've said it's on the way. Um, thank you so much. Um, next, I'd love to welcome Camille T. Dungy, the author of four collections of poetry, most recently, Trophic Cascade, and the essay collection, Guidebook to Relative Strangers, Journeys into Race, Motherhood, and History. She's also edited three anthologies, including Black Nature, Four Centuries of African-American Nature Poetry. Her honors include a Guggenheim Fellowship, an NEA Fellowship in both poetry and prose, and an American Book Award. She lives in Colorado with her husband and daughter and teaches at Colorado State University, where she has just been named University Distinguished Professor. And let's unmute you and spotlight. Hello. This is... I just am, ha thank you, Erica. I haven't heard that phrase out loud. It was just announced yesterday. So Julia, you're the first person to say those words out loud, the university distinguished professor thing. So thank you. It, it feels lovely to hear that in the space of other mothers who understand what it means to try and juggle um, this, this one love of ours that is writing with these other loves of ours that are these 
humans who we're trying to raise in this world. So thank you. Um, I'm going to read four poems. I'll start. There are these moments of permission. Between raindrops, space, certainly. But we call it all rain. I hang in the undrenched intervals while Callie is sleeping. My old self necessary and imperceptible as air. I wrote that, by the way, on an airplane um, beverage napkin, flying from one reading, from home to a reading, and I just like scribbled it on that napkin, and then it became that poem. I'm gonna read this poem. It's in Trophic Cascade, but I'm actually gonna read it from this new anthology, Rock by the Waters, which is this fantastic new anthology of poems of motherhood. Um, I was not able to participate in one of their readings, but I thought I would just give a little shout out to it. It's exciting to see a book of 200 some pages of this, um, this topic entirely. So maybe add it to your indie book list. Conspiracy to breathe together. Last week, a woman smiled at my daughter and I wondered if she might have been the sort of girl my mother says spat on my aunt when they were children in Virginia, all those acts and laws ago. Half the time I can't tell my experiences apart from the ghosts. A shirt my mother gave me settles into my chest. I should say onto my chest, but I am self-conscious. The way the men watch me while I move toward them makes my heart trip and slide and threaten to bruise so that inside my chest, I feel the pressure of her body, her mother's breast, her mother's mother's big loving bounty. I wear my daughter the way some women other places are taught to wear their young. Sometimes when people smile, I wonder if they think I'm being quaintly primitive. The cloth I wrap her in is brightly patterned, African, and the baby's hair mains her alert head in such a way she has often been compared to an animal. There is a stroller in the garage, but I don't want to be taken as my own child's nanny. Half the time, I know my fears are mine alone. At my shower, a Cameroonian woman helped me practice putting a toy baby on my back. I stood in the middle of a circle of women, stooped over and fumbling with the cloth. Curious George was the only doll on hand, so the white women looked away, afraid I would hurt my baby, while the black women looked away and thought about not thinking about monkeys. I walk every day with my daughter and wonder what is happening to other people's minds. Half the time I am filled with terror. Half the time I am full of myself. The baby is sleeping on my back again. When I stand still, I can feel her breathing. But when I start to move, I lose her in the rhythms of my tread. So uh, over my shoulder, I just realized this as I was reading, that cloth that's on my reading bench is actually one of those cloths <laughs> that I used to wear my daughter in when I was working in my office and walking around. So let me have a visual of it. I loved it so much, I didn't want to just get rid of it. So I used it to upholster my reading bench. Trophic Cascade. After the reintroduction of gray wolves to Yellowstone and as anticipated, their culling of deer. Trees grew beyond the deer stunt of the mid-century. In their upreach, songbirds nested, who scattered seed for underbrush, and in that cover wore in snowshoe hair. Weasel and water shrew returned, also wool, and came soon hawk and falcon, bald eagle, kestrel, and with them hawk shadow, falcon shadow, 
Eagle shade and kestrel shade haunted newly buried runnels where mule deer no longer rummaged, cautious as they were now of being surprised by wolves. Berries brought bare, while undergrowth and willows growing now right down to the river brought beavers who dam. Muskrats came to the dams and tadpoles, came to the night song of the fathers of tadpoles. Water striders, with water striders, the dark gray American dipper bobbed in fresh pools of the river, and fish stayed. And the bear who fished also culled deer fawns, and to their kill scraps came vulture and coyote, long gone in the region until now. And their scat scattered seed, and more trees, brush, and berries grew up along the river that had run straight and so flooded, but thus damned, compelled to meander, is less prone to overrun. Don't you tell me, this is not the same as my story. All this life born from one hungry animal, this whole new landscape, the course of the river changed. I know this, I reintroduced myself to myself, this time a mother, after which nothing, was ever the same. One last poem with a statistic that may or may not freak out all of you readers and listeners. The average mother loses 700 hours of sleep in the first year of her child's life. Or what that first year taught me about America. Most of us favor one side when we walk. As we tire, we lean into that side and stop moving in a straight line. So it takes longer to get anywhere, let alone home. In wilderness conditions where people don't know the terrain, a tired person might end up leaning so far into one side, they'll walk in a circle rather than straight ahead. It can kill you, such leaning, and it can get you killed. Rest helps. I told my husband, I walked in a circle in my mind, but you came out okay. Initially, he asked me to clarify, but then he let it go. Who wrote that first, if you lived here, you'd be home by now sign? It seems I'm going to have to move. I'm tired and also sick of helping other people in lieu of helping myself. Rest now. It's really not that bad. We're in the home stretch. That's the mind of a parent. Relentless optimism in the face of sheer panic and exhaustion. Thank you. Do you want to come say hi really quickly? This is your moment. Nope. This is her. All right. <laughs> now bye. <laughs> what timing, right? She knew exactly when to enter. <laughs> she knew She's exactly. Stealing my paper. <laughs> okay. Up next, we have Sonia Greenfield. Thank you, Camille. That was... Magnific Thank you. Magnificent. I'm so glad. It's like we didn't need AWP. We have this. It's even better. <laughs> um, Sonia Greenfield is the author of two full length collections The Let Down, just out with White Pine Press, link forthcoming right to you, and The Boy with a Halo at the Farmer's Market, winner of the 2014 Codhill Press Poetry Prize. Her chapbook, American Parable, won the Autumn House Prize for 2018. She lives in Minneapolis with her family, where she teaches at Normandale College and edits Rise Up Review, a wonderful publication, which you should check out if you haven't. And let's unmute and lovelily spotlight her. Hi, everybody. 
Thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm so excited to be a part of this. Julia, thank you for putting this series together. It's really been amazing. So yeah, I'm gonna read from Let Down, just to give you a little context. The book is about um, infertility and miscarriage and my son's um, diagnosis of autism. Um, but the book is not um, entirely a, a tragic, sad book. There's a lot of joy in it too. Um, <clears throat> and it's all um, numbered prose poems. There are 64 of them in the book. Um, and so one way to look at it is that it's a, um, a 64 section, one long poem, or that it's 24 untitled prose poems. Um, that said, I'm probably just gonna read straight through um, instead of introducing each piece. And I'll just start with number four. I want to describe it to tell the whole story, but the birthing suite and its muted walls were details lost in rage, and the Joni Mitchell I played, the candy of her voice could not be heard over my retching. That all the ways I thought I had prepared were like closing a sliding door on a tsunami. That I couldn't listen to myself whimper anymore, the anesthesiologist floating to me like a goddess in institutional blue while I leaned over, trembling as the thick blissful needle slipped deep into my back while I hugged the ball of you. How this is the point where what was should overlay on top of what should have been. That your heart decelerated, machines binged, and your father fetched the nurse. That nurses and doctor rocked my dead legs back and forth to dislodge you. That I had to push you out before full dilation, my cervix tearing. And the doctor was stitching for so long. And you, glistening violet, looked me in the face. And the minute you latched on, I became remade in your image that I would have liked to do it again, but by the time it was possible, I couldn't. I'm gonna jump all the way to number 22. Joy is pocket-sized, like quarter rides. We could ignore the patina of grime on the pagodas in Chinatown where dusk dropped wet against the steamed windows of the dumpling shop, which was one bead on a string that went herb shop, gold Buddha shop, bonsai shop, repeat, until pinwheels in the pinwheel store turned to the breeze and you said, bye wind, then blue kisses I tried to catch. I carried pockets so full of quarters, we jingled, as we headed past the koi fountain, teeming with ghost fish, past the old smoking man, past lanterns, sunburned, red to pink, to the plaza where paint-flecked rides bucked against the gloom. And we paid again and again until the mechanical frog churned and galloped you all the way past believing we would ever find ourselves empty-handed. Eyelash decided to jump into my eye right at that point. Um, okay, number 23. EEG creation date, 15, 29, 39, August 23rd, 2012. I think the brain is rivers of electricity, the cities of electricity that it looks like a metropolis from an airplane. Your electricity is learning new routes, like how to work around glioses, little scars, little scares. Your EEG is a paper of squiggly lines, a code, each line telling the story of impulses, some lines quivering with uncertainty. 
In the office, I said, look, now you get to become a robot as the tech gelled wires to your head. I said, look, you are a handsome sheik who must be still with a white sheet wrapped around multicolored wires plugged into a silver box with a heavy cord leading to a computer that wrote 31 lines about your brain. I said, look, the computer just wrote a poem about your legs and how they have a mind of their own. I said, let's beep like robots. I said, don't move now. I said, okay, tell me how old you are again. You said, free. That's right, free. Number 47. Deja vu was the same bright red gem of blood on the toilet paper, the same profound cramping, the same newsletter saying my fetus was the size of a poppy seed. So early, such an ovum is just a whisper of maybe. One can barely call it a miscarry when what is carried is just a speck of desire embedded in blood. That night you curled in the dark of your bed as my face glowed by computer light. I haunted websites for grieving mothers and clicked on pictures of lost children to let mourning sicken me, to make me wretch, to let it draw out every last clot. Those babies belong to others, but I have no faces for what I lost. So I co-opted eyes and smiles frozen in photo time. Eyes and smiles, not mine. And this book is written in the second person, sort of. It addresses my son through it. So there's a lot of um, you in the poem. Um, but I do um, have a couple places where I let my son, my son come forward and speak. Um, and this is one of those poems, number 54. You say, I don't want to calm down. I want to calm up. I say, I need you to be patient. And you say, being patient is not available. You say, I'm upset because my other nostril ran out of batteries. I say, you're cute and I love you. And you say, I'm cute and I love you too. You say, when I grow up to be a flying pest, I'm going to guard your apples. You say, when I was a baby, I had cutie marks. And I say, and now you have beauty marks. And you say, I have buta marks because I'm buta full. You say, I coughed up my tummy. You say, does this splinter make me look fat? I ask, what do you want for breakfast? And you say, I want silver linings for breakfast. I say, I love you. And then I ask, don't you want to say I love you too? And you say, I'm loading, mama. You have to wait. You say, mama, I want to drink a case of you. And I'm going to finish up with number 61. All those years adrift in our spaceship with its weird silvery angles and odd pinging. But now this therapy office where we have landed feels a little like your home planet. How good it is to be surrounded by creatures who look just like jostling boys, drawing math figures onto the air as if it were a plane of paper and their fingers were markers made of magic. When the front door to this lobby closes with a quiet click, you twitch your way in and grab a wand from your pocket. Well, not a wand, really, but a stick of lightning to trace constellations on the ceiling. Well, not a stick either, to be honest, but a mind that makes these things out of dendrites and synapses, while the rest of us from the duller part of Earth act like we're the clever ones. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you so much. Oh, Sonia, you're so kind to only, you know, steal from your son in certain moments. I feel like I just get all my poems from my son's mouth. I just steal it all. <laughs> um, I'm so excited to welcome Keicha Kaipurs, who is the author of three books of poems, a former Stegner fellow, uh, and a University of Oregon grad like me. It's not in her bio, but I'm putting it in there because we went to Oregon, but not at the same time. Um, so her work has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, um, as well as the Pushcart Prize and Best American Poetry Anthologies. She is the editor of Poetry Northwest and will be visiting Professor of Creative Writing. Oh, that's exciting. I didn't know this at the University of Montana in 2020 to 2021. You're going to be in Montana. Wow. Um, and I will be posting links to where you can get her gorgeous books. And I cannot wait to hear her read again. Unmute and stop. Thank you guys so much. Um, I already feel like I'm gonna cry, so I'm gonna try to say this without crying. I'll see now. I'm already crying. Um, uh, Erica Miner, who's who's here somewhere this evening, has heard me say over the last eight weeks that I don't really miss people. That I'm good. That um, I lived in a cabin by myself for so seven months in the wilderness, this is nothing. But then I have an experience like this and I really miss people. <laughs> I miss not the people I see at like first grade drop off, like in the parking lot. I don't, I still don't miss those people, but, but I miss you people. I miss um, the poets and the thinkers and like the feelers, the people who feel things. I miss people who feel things. So anyways, thank you guys. All right, beyond the crying. Okay, um, so I'm gonna read uh, four poems from, um, from my most recent book. And um, so I'm gonna skip over a couple that are, that are in the document and I'll tell you when I am. This is Still Life with Nursing Bra. Fall open, unfold me. Hook and eye undone with one hand. Fingers that know their way now in the dark. You contain me. Underwire circling my breasts in half bangle, like the copper bracelets, lemniscating wrists of women who've never worn bras, never held back their multitudes. You of the hidden crab apple bruise yellowing on my chest. You of her ecstasy, eyes rolled back in her head, hands in her sweat damp hair. You milk that rivers down my skin, shimmering of hunger, the want of a wet mouth. Nursing bra, black, nude, electric orange and lace trimmed, tucked in the back of the drawer or hung dangling from a doorknob. I once fumbled with you, stale of the dentist's lobby, cut by a thin mewling that made us all shiver. The waiting room's terrified ripple as I struggled with the clasp that kept me from spilling open. Instead, the leaking through, a sticky flower blooming down my chest until I wrenched you free, flapping and fearless, one wing taking flight from my breast. So this book um, is full of poems that are about um, being pregnant, uh, having an, a, an infant and a young child, or I guess full of poems in which that is the experience of the speaker. But um, many of the poems are not about those things. They just have those things in them. And, and, and so motherhood for me um, has become a way of writing about everything else in the world. That is true. Getting the baby to sleep. Sometimes the baby can't reconcile the self with the self. Too hungry to eat too tired to sleep. 
I know the feeling. Oh, America, on those nights when you are too beautiful for me to continue to forgive you any longer, for allowing us to kill each other with your graceless bullets, or exile our neighbors across the fences of your fictitious border, or argue over the ownership of each young girl's body as if its freedom is a lie she must stop telling herself. Then, America, I go out into your radiant arms. The baby and I drive through your streets, over the bridge and its light-chipped waters, under a moon so big, so full of itself, that though I know it belongs to the world, it can't be anything but American. I hang my arm out the window and skim the air like touching skin. I breathe you in and the baby sleeps. So I'm gonna skip the next two poems and go to, um, go to a poem called The Great Lakes. Every, every June, not this June, of course, but every June, um, my family goes back to Michigan, which is where my parents are from. They're high school sweethearts from a small town in Michigan on Lake Michigan. And um, my, my mom grew up um, pumping gas for like rich tourists from Chicago who would come over to um, rent houses on the lake for the summer. And she always said that someday she would get to visit the lake as a tourist. And so we do that now and every June, go back and see all my extended family who are there and we, we get to hang out on the lake a little bit. The Great Lakes. My wife. The one I thought I'd never have, because does any of us believe we deserve to be happy in this life? Let's my daughter paint her toenails a sloppy silver as my aunt smokes a second cigarette and pages through photos on her phone so I can see how the car looked after my cousin wrecked it last month in a past midnight field near the poultry processing plant just a half mile from grandma's unsold house high on meth or heroin, or maybe not high at all, but fighting her hunger. While I pick through this dead girl's jewelry, just as starved for something to hold onto as those feckless gulls pecking the sand a few feet away. The sun is shining brighter than the gold-plated necklace I fasten around my neck and swear to wear forever. And even though scientists are finding nicotine in the water and oxy in the muscles, my cousin's kids are down there at the edge of the beach, screaming their heads off with the pure joy of plunging below the surface. It's hard not to feel good watching the waves. But my aunt needs me to believe in the glass and the blood and her daughter's body, a thing unidentifiable, a thing none of us had really seen in years. She needs me to understand that her pain is water as far as the eye can see. Um. I'm gonna finish with my daughter's favorite poem from this book. Um, she just just loves herself, loves it when she makes an appearance. So she's she's in this one and, um, and uh, she has no idea what it's really about. Told you so. When my daughter spills her orange juice, I wipe it off the linoleum with the old plaid boxers of the man I thought I'd marry. Elastic ripped out, seams unraveling. I've had lives already. At night, they crawl across my skin before I can turn on the light. We spend all these years wanting, and then one day, sudden as a lamp set to a timer, we have. There were the nights I drank, just so I could feel a little more of my own unhappiness. Now, with my feet pressed into this rug, 
I'll never be that drunk again. Before I went to the clinic to get pregnant, I cried onto the shoulder of an old flame, worried that whoever I loved next would never know my body when it was beautiful. How could I have been wrong about so many things? Thanks for letting me have some feelings tonight, guys. <laughs> it was really fun to be here. Have all the feelings. <laughs> oh. I feel like after each of you reading, I like need a moment before I can really introduce the next reader because you guys are just amazing. Um, our final reader tonight is Era D. Matthews, who is the author of Simulacra, and I will post the link available from Yale University Press and winner of the 2016 Yale, Younger, Yale series of Younger Poets, selected by uh, Carl Phillips. Um, she received an MFA from the Helen Zell Writers Program at the University of Michigan, a Kave Kahnem Fellow, and a Kresge Literary Arts Fellow. She is a founding member of the Riven Collective. She is an assistant professor of Bryn Mawr College and lives in our glorious city where I live, in the city of brotherly love in Philly. Um, welcome. Unmute. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm really happy to be here tonight. I think because one, I love your company. I realize how much I miss hearing words, like hearing other people speaking um, and not needing to, I guess because of all this homeschooling, it's like people's talk and then you have to respond to them, right? Your kids need something and it's like immediate response. And so, this gives a moment for everything to sink in before needing to say anything or not in not needing to say anything. So it's kind of like this beautiful liminal space in this really weird time that we're in. So thank you for curating this, Julia. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna read two poems from um, Simulacra and then I'm gonna read a couple of new poems if I have time or maybe just one new poem. Simulacra is essentially about existential longing and thinking about oneself in fullness, right? So we aren't all just mothers, but there's so many other dimensions to our identity. And I think a lot of times we get, you know, described as one thing, and then we're narrowly constrained in that identity, whatever that identity is. It could be blackness, it could be motherhood, it could be anything. And so the book really tries to address some of those, um, to break out of narrow constraints and to address some of those issues, um, not the least of which is mental health as a mother. I'm gonna start with Psyche on Prozac. The prescribed sleep makes her hear everything clearly. Gone are nights of grand departures and warring gods vying for last words. This strange season brings acute sighs of grubbed out thistle and ragworts resisting asphyxia. She feels little about the vacancy their slow death offers, rows of poppy seeds and chickpeas she might plant. She feels little at all, actually. Infernal torpor. Has it even considered why every mirror is veiled by gauze, singed by the lantern's flame? She has only the vaguest memory of her former self or how that otter smooth arrow scar on her arm got there or how Venus thrust her head against the cellar floor. She can't see the welted geometry worries whip marks left on her back. Time, that immaculate housekeeper long since removed the yellow tape mopped blood pools and dusted crystal vessels filled with black rank water and gales. All the gods who saved her have new caseloads. Her sisters have washed ashore. Pleasure is crying, starved. Tonight's supper is burning again. Psyche opens the oven door, places her bare hands on the calphalon pan spilling over with ambrosia again. Tells the family, it's time to eat. They gather round her. Cupid doesn't notice her blistering scalds or know she revels in being scorched awake in the moments before giving thanks for their darkened portion of forever. 
there are limits to what even love can know. This next poem is um, about my grandmother who spoke in a very similar, I had a very similar turn of phrase as Gertrude Stein did. Um, and a lot of that really just had to do with the fact that my grandmother had a fifth grade education. Um, uh, no more than that, came up in the Great Migration, settled in New Jersey, where she got a factory job and worked for very many years, making very little money for a whole lot of work. Um, and I remember when I first read Gertrude Stein, the diction seemed familiar to me. It seemed like a familiar tongue. And a lot of that had to do with the techniques that Stein was not so much introducing, but in my opinion, appropriating. So. Uh, this is called If My Late Grandmother Were Gertrude Stein. One, Southern Migration. Leech, broke speech, leaf ain't pruning, pot lay, lie, lie, hair straight off, arrowed branch and horse joint, elbow ash, row fish, row dog, slow milk pig, blue water sister, hogs like willow. Weep crow, weep cow, so bug, so narrow, inch way, inches away, over the bridge, back that way, fur, fur needles and coal. Black hole, black out, black feet, blame, long way still, not there. There, here, same. Two, feed the saw. Old crow, liquor, drink, drunk, girdle, grits, grit, tea, grit, tea, tea, get, get shaved, shooked, shucked, shit, flower, flower, lard and swallow, hard edge, chew, chip, tooth, bite, tool, chip, bite, bloat, 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 blight, seat, blight, sit, tea, be light, city, downtown, dim, slight, dark, old arc, new arc, new arc, new work, nork. Lark fed, cornbread, bed feather back, Sunday shack, church fat, grease glove, dust rub, cheap heeled shoe, window seat, mirror eye, window eye, window, window, when though. Wind blow, November, December, no cinder, no slumber, no summer. Branch, branched, blanched, fried, freed, fly, want what, want what, want what graves want. Three, miscegenation. Good, smooth, curly haired baby, baby rock by my baby, mama rock by her baby. Wrestle the earth, baby, no dirt, no. Dirt shine, shine, shine neck, porcelain, tin, tarnish, powder, milk, pout her, milk, powder, silk inheritance. Front the wash tub, top the bed, bin, leaky numbers run in, run in, run on. Red fever holds your palm, sweat it out, hot, hot. Heat the rest, pretty melt that wax wide flower. Ellis Island, daddy, oh, daddy's bar. Band, mongrel hum. Come, come now, little bones bend. Old crack, creak, crank, crick, curly cue. Fuck them, then fuck them. You hear me, good hair baby? Walk through. Half of you belong. Four on Gertrude Stein. Who? Bills mount, Picasso who, Matisse who, mortgage, no currency, canvas, pay, brushes, stroke, stroke, bridge, brittle, blend, 10 miles, day break, 10 miles, they break, we broke. No brick, widgets in the envelope, no railroad green, agriculture, pea snap, earth under nails, spine and stilt, woman, roach kill, heel, woman, roaches in the crawl, woman, creep, keep, fifth grade, where, everywhere, we're, everywhere, anyhow. We sacrifice and hammer, they sacrifice the hammer, never. Ax and hatchet make callous, hard hand, prison pen, privilege, prison, privilege pin, bar, thorn pin, pine cross, crown, wait, wait, wait. Iron is harder. Chicken fat can is full of spark, spark kill, or spark coal, or spark cull, ho. Heave, ho. Heave, holy, heavy, heavy. Heavy, light's genius. That is that, Gertrude. Who? Um, trying to decide what to read next. I think I'm only gonna read. Okay, I guess I'll read two more, but they'll be short. His Eye on the Sparrow, after Hanif. 
I guess black people can write about flowers at a time like this, since every poem turns on itself, starts one way and ends another. We see it in nature too, how seed turns to leaf regardless of its earth or the thought inside my head blossoms into a hyacinth with, with as sweet a scent. I dream of Mamie Till often, she walks the church aisle towards her son's body while wisteria bloats the casket's brim and papered bougainvillea bracts emerge where his eye once was. An entire garden from the nutrients of the body's soil. And then too, and then too, all those birds that circle Emmett's pillowed corpse. So many in the tabernacle not harbingers of his God's descent, not refugees fleeing his body exilic, but ecstasy's round arrows. We living have it all wrong. When eternity's concerned, sparrows don't take leave. They fly into you. And last but not least, maybe last. Well, since I can't find the first part of the poem, we're gonna read a different poem. How about that? <laughs> this is called Legacy. And then there are those who in the words of artist Mendel Black, inherit rebellion. Large lots of unbeing passed down one generation to the next. Absent value on the free market, nothing gets resolved. Too many other worries anyhow. The who, what, when, where of basic living. Simple names are expensive. It costs too much to be pronounced. But yet, best yet, to curl under the weight of obscurity. Put on the full armor of mundane gods who see fit to have their heirs waste away among brothers fattened from lamb. That's it. Thank you. What a reading, right, everybody? I can see the nods. Um, I'm so excited to have us all engage in a little bit of conversation, but for um, the many writers in the room, I'm sure, um, here is a prompt for you as is part of this reading series to connect us and to give us something all to investigate. Um, so the prompt is to investigate a mother's name, to write a poem that explores the name of a mother, its history, origin, geography. It doesn't have to be your own mother's, but it could be. Maybe it could be your name if you're a mother. Think about the power and powerlessness of naming, everything it gives and takes away. How does this relate to mothers and motherhood? Um, and I think this prompt comes in large part to you, Era, because that poem about your name, Era, I just can't, I, I still hear it. I hear it that time that you read it. Um, and I think there is so much in a name and I, I, I challenge others to explore that. Um, so if you have questions, I would love for you to type in the chat, like I have a question um, and I can unmute you and you can ask it, my cat. Um, and if you don't want to ask it yourself, you can just type it in and I'm happy to read it for you. Um, I'm gonna unmute all of our um, readers so that they can ask each other questions they would like. If no one has one right now, I'll start with just a really easy one. Um, given your um, increased burdens of motherhood, joys of motherhood, whatever word you wanna uh, use for them, how has this affected your writing currently? Are you producing a lot? Are you producing a little? Everyone's having such a different response to the way they, you know, are approaching their own writing um, or their own reading in this time. And so I'm sure a lot of people would love to hear from you. Uh, 
Um, I'll say that uh, I have actually been way, way more productive than I've been probably in years. And that I sort of, I'm chalking it up to, um, uh, I had a therapist tell me I don't survive trauma, I thrive in it, which doesn't, (laughs) That's, I think she meant a compliment, but like, I was like, oh no, that's terrible. Um, so I think that under great stress, <coughs> I tend to um, do really well. Um, and at a time that isn't now, I'll like go back to therapy and examine like, hmm, why am I attracted to crisis? Um, why do I become more functional in those situations? And can unpack that at a later time. But for now, I'm just gonna ride that and let that be uh, maybe a bad survival strategy, but one that's working for me, so. Can we switch back to the other version? So, cause I couldn't see Tracy. The speaker. Pop up to her. Here we go. Speaker. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have not been writing. <laughs> um, I, I feel like this entire experience, um, every week has been so different. Every day has been so different. I mean, they all run together into an endless monotony. And yet um, the days that are good are such good days. The days that are bad are such really, truly horrible days. And um, so there's this incredible difference between the magic and and the desire to flee. Um, I... I have just started forcing myself to write um, this month, which I don't believe in that. I'm, I've never been someone who has written every day. I've never said that I have to be on some kind of schedule. I've allowed myself months at a time where I don't write. And then sometimes I'm writing all the time and I've always really felt good about that and felt like the times when I'm not writing, I'm, I'm storing things up but I'm making myself right now because for the first time in my life, I don't think I'm storing anything up (laughs) because um, there is nothing, there is no engine in my days. And um, if there's no engine, if there's nothing running, then then what what kind of energy can I possibly um, be, be creating? and saving for my work and I'm not. So I have to, I'm, I'm forcing myself to write and it's pretty um, ugly and, uh, and feels very useless a lot of the time. Um, and yet it feels better than, than actually being useless, which is what I feel like I am the rest of the time. So, so I am writing something that someone might call a poem a day. I wouldn't call it a poem. Maybe someday. I I am also writing most days, not every day, but I'm trying to write fairly regularly. Um, and partially just because I want to be a writer, right? Like that's a thing that I value. Um, and I feel like things are happening that I want to capture on the page. So I journal and then that journaling spills over and I'm trying to read more than um than watch the news and and be on social media and get the news that way i'm like i'm really trying to read as um before i go to bed and when i wake up in the morning to center myself in what i do value in the world as opposed to all of that other noise but another reason that i'm trying to write and i'm i'm less with a with a husband or a partner who's really who makes sure that this can happen also it's probably probably survival on his part because I'm really horrible (laughs) to be around if I don't write regularly but but that doesn't have to be the case but one of the reasons that I'm really trying to write is I asked my daughter a few weeks ago if now that we're all home if our lives look like what she thought they look like, right? If the the kind of life of her two professor parents Mm -hmm. looks like what she thought it looks like. And she said, not really. She kind of thought that when she was at school all the time, we were just partying. (laughs) 
<laughs> which was just like a sweet idea. Like she just like thought that we were sending her off to school because we were busy, but our busyness wasn't really anything important. And so I, I heard that and I realized, oh wait, I actually have to be busy doing this thing that I value then, right? Like I have to show her that this is work that I'm doing, that it's important and that it's something that I need to prioritize and that when she finds things in her life that are valuable and important to her, that she has to prioritize those as well. And she needs to find people around her who will help her do that. And so partially it's obviously self-serving because I want to be a writer, but partially it is a modeling issue for me that I want to model for my daughter that when I'm writing, I'm doing work that is important, that deserves this time. Uh, similarly, I feel like I am writing more um, just because I write when I don't, I write to understand things. Yeah. I don't really understand anything right now. Like I feel like I'm trying to ask questions of something larger than something outside of myself. So I do find that I'm writing a lot. I also find that I'm um, playing a lot with form, which usually if I were to write something, I would just write it and then try and wedge it inside of a form at a later date, or if it just came naturally inside of a form, just let it be. But right now, and by form, I mean kind of the visual structure of the poem right now. I'm not so much the received form, but the visual structure of the poem. And I think that I'm working inside of that just in this moment um, because I'm trying to teach myself something new, right? So and I think that's important to try, you know, when you don't understand something, what can you do? You try to teach yourself something new. I mean, you're either the answer is gonna be new to you or the way that you find the answer is gonna be new. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's helping me a good, it's helping me a great deal to kind of deal with the everyday realities of um, how hard it is for, for me and I think for all of us to not have something you can look forward to, you know? Um, I wake up every day and do the same thing, essentially. You know, it changes in, by degrees, by very slight degree, but I wake up and do the same thing. And for someone with my personality type, that's deadening. And so I'm trying to find ways not to feel numb to what's happening and to still ask questions of what's happening and the writing is really one of the few ways that I can do that. Um, and working inside of like Photoshop and Illustrator and teaching myself those, those, um, those applications, it's been really helpful for me. Yeah, I'm not writing. I'm reading a lot of uh, dopey, I'm uh, yeah, reading dopey murder mysteries one after the other. And um, my, big project right now is homeschooling a child with special needs. So like, that's what I'm working on right now um, every day. And I find that trying to squeeze in time to do writing on my own um, isn't working out so much right now, but I'm taking a lot of notes <clears throat> on things that I want to write when I get around to writing them. <clears throat> and, um, I also have this fantasy about uh, going into my files and editing all of the poems that didn't quite work out, um, but that hasn't happened either. Um, <clears throat> and now I'm hearing that all of my kids' summer camps are going to be canceled one after the other. And I'm like, when am I ever gonna be a poet again? I don't know, someday maybe. So, um, but you know what, getting, um, right now I'm putting my son's uh, education in front of my own uh, writing at the moment and, and I'm okay with that because um, that feels like that has to come first so anyway that's me yeah I I've feel that Sonia. I, I am homeschooling a first grader and my wife had a baby in December and she works full time. So she locks herself in our bedroom all day long and um, is on calls and Zoom meetings and 
is working and I am with uh, a baby and a seven year old <laughs> all day long. And they don't, not only do they not let me write, they don't let me do shit. So um, it's basically like a miracle if I can make lunch for all of us. Um, it's yeah, I, I would like to say that I'm reading, not really doing that. Sometimes if I, I usually fall asleep in my daughter's bed every night and sometimes I'll read like with a flashlight in her bed um, for like five minutes, <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's a, a brutal time as yeah. a creative person and yeah. as someone who not only wants to make, but wants to thrive on other people's creativity and, and art as well. It's, I feel very cut off from all of that. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is just reminds me of those. I mean, you actually have a newborn in your house, Kucha, right? Like it reminds me of those those days of just constant, right? Like I I I just said the thing about writing, but that all ends at nine thirty in the morning, right? Like so, the ability for my to for me to do that means I'm waking up at like five or six in the morning, in if I'm gonna have a long stretch of time but usually I'm too exhausted so it's like an hour and a half <laughs> in the morning that I get and then at 9 30 I'm at school um duty and I feel like Erica Meitner in a conversation that I had with other mothers last week said a really important thing it was either Erica Meitner or Amy Nosuka Matado that like, we are actually doing a lot of other creative work and then I feel like we need to to value that. So Sonia's notes, right, of like the notes that she's keeping, like all the things we're doing, this, this, this kind of teaching that we're doing, the cooking that we're doing, the, like, um, the cleaning, all of these kinds of um, the just being are, are a different level of psychic weight and and demands on our creativity than I think many of us have experienced in a long time and to acknowledge that and accept that we are in fact putting our making our poesis part of ourselves into the world in other um, in other modes and being gentle to ourselves and accepting yes mm -hmm. There was an earlier question that was higher up uh, that about do we have exercises that lift the burden of pressuring ourselves to write or even read if we don't have the space. Um, finding it difficult to focus and sustain lately and the frustration that comes with um, feeling that pressure to be creative or to make. Um, I think the thing that just occurred to me was um, uh, since Erica's come up, I've been in a writing group with Erica and we've just done, uh, or I've just said, I can't write a poem a day, but I can send a blob. So like not even, I'm not trying to make poems. I'm just like, here's the thing. Um, and I did actually for Poetry Northwest, I did a whole like post about failure and writing failures and like every grief poem I ever wrote was a failure. Um, but the idea of like, I just want to make 10 failures, right? Like I just, I, I just want to try this. Um, and if we stop calling what we're doing, we're not trying to make poems, we're just trying to make blobs, or I really want to uh, write a failed grief poem, or failed grief lines today, um, and just doing that. The other thing that's been working for me is um, uh, um, list poems. So like I've written several list poems that just say today, 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 which is sort of like in that pandemic diary way of just like recording things that I'm noticing because I too, I like I want to, um, this is why I give myself permission to fail, um, especially in hard times, because I don't want to forget. Um, and even the things I've managed to scrape out of myself during the worst times of my life, I've been really grateful later that I got them down. So those are, those are a few tricks uh, that I try sometimes is what I call it, um, or a list poem, um, those kinds of things. I have a friend who, um, <laughs> she she told me last year she's like I I'm I do New Year's resolutions every year but um she's like but this year my New Year's resolutions she's like I'm pasting them up and they're gonna all be things that I already do so that 
when, so that I feel a sense of accomplishment because I've already done them and I've like achieved my New Year's resolutions. So I feel like giving yourself credit for the things you're already doing, like, I did read for five minutes today. Like, yes, that was an act of me being a participant in, in the artistic and creative world. And, and like, I had an idea and I jotted it down on a scrap of paper and it was one line, but look at that. I made a line. So maybe it's sort of like acknowledging that even though you are not, you know, accomplishing these things, you're not writing these complete poems, um, you're not, you know, revising a manuscript necessarily, um, acknowledging that yourself as a thinker and a feeler and in these tiny ways still a participant in, in this, you know, world of making and creating that, that you probably are already doing those things in, in small ways and, and saying like, Yes, self, you are doing it. I think that might be a way to, to, to feel, not only feel good, and this, this is a pep talk I'm giving myself, but not only feel good, but also I feel like when I acknowledge that I'm doing those things, I can do them a little bit more. I didn't see any other questions um, before we end. Do any of you have any questions for one another based on that incredible reading? Okay. Um, well, we can, we can end here. Um, this was wonderful. I'm so grateful for each and every one of you and each and every one of those poems. Um, and I'll just say for, for me, because my son's four, I've given up on pre-K homeschool. I'm just like, <laughs> F it. I, I, because the days when I try to make him do things on a structure are so much harder than the days when I let the form you know like the form of motherhood show me where to go it's like listening to a poem you know when we listen to what the poem is doing it's so much better than that poem we thought we were writing than the intention um so there's a lot of ways i think motherhood teaches us about poetry thank you all so much um next week there is not a uh reading because it's every two weeks um but at the same time i'm gonna have a book launch for my second book that never got a book launch that came out in march so that's what'll happen and it'll have special lovely guests and it should be fun and then the week after that um we're gonna have poetry about sex Hopefully, I'm waiting to confirm all the readers, but Erica should be reading, and um, Rachel, who's here, should be reading, and um, a lot of other lovely readers, because who doesn't want to hear about, oh, Erica's confirming right here, yes, all good, it's going to be so good, guys, um, so May 20th, come on back and hear poetry about sex. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. It's pretty great to see all those names. Everybody, I'm going to unmute all in case you want to like all clap because everybody's yes. all clap. <laughs> These strict security measures come